Yeah, excellent. Uh, may we start? Perfect, thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, it's a great honor to be with us uh, tonight. Uh, three uh, eminent professors and eminent stars in orthopedic surgery from all over the world. The first presentation will be by uh, Mr. Ashwin Yonathan from UK. He will speak about uh, hip dislocation. Uh, then another uh, presentation by uh, Pro Major General Professor Rauf Al Abbas. He will speak about fracture of the neck of the femur. And then our dear beloved professor, uh, Professor Baha Korana. Al Azhar University will speak about fracture of the femoral head. We will start with the presentation of Mr. Ashwin Yonathan from UK. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation and for joining us tonight, sir. May you start, please, sir? Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to your talk. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's Christmas here. And, yeah. and, uh, uh, and Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas sir. And Merry Christmas to everybody. And, and thank you for Mo Imam um, for, uh, for letting me know about this great uh, opportunity to talk. Okay, can I start? Yes, sir, please. So, um, um, hip dislocation uh, comes with a significant force. And normally it occurs um, as a result of a fracture or because of trauma. So my, my primary aim today is to talk about virgin hips, but I am more than happy to take up, um, any questions about um, uh, hips which are dislocated from a hip replacement. As a matter of fact, majority of my work is, is around dislocated hips uh, from a hip replacement. Um, my, um, I am a, a trauma and elective surgeon, 50% of my work is from virgin hips and 50% of my work is from dislocated hips. Um, so just to uh, go through um, something about the anatomy of the hip, uh, as we know, two third of the, uh, of the hip replacement um, uh, is uh, the femoral two third of the smear, of the smear and the astablum is a U-shaped articular surface, but the most important thing is the ligamentum teres, which supplies the blood supply for the femoral head. Now, the important thing which is important here is to know that 40% of the femoral head is in contact with the astabular articular surface, and 10% of the femoral head is in contact with the labra. Now, if, when, if you do um, uh, anatomy or a dissection of the femoral head, you can see that the, uh, that the labrum is a strong uh, fibrous ring, um, uh, which in, it increases the, the articular surface of the femoral head and which gives the hip joint its stability. Now, if you look at the antiversion of the hip, about seven, um, it's an average of seven percentage in a Caucasian female. And, so, and in a male, it comes to about 14 percentage. Now, I, I am talking in terms of, uh, uh, majoritively in terms of uh, when you are asked a question in the FRCS or as a matter of fact, in, in real life. And the most of the questions are asked about the femoral head um, from the blood supply. And the blood supply, majority of that comes from the ligamentum teres. And as it continue, uh, as we all know, um, it is mostly in children. And as, you, as, as the age goes by, the ligamentum teres blood supply from elderly decreases. Now, one thing which is quite important to understand is the blood supply of the femoral head from the ascending cervical branch. It penetrates the capsule near the femoral attachment and ascends along the neck. And this perforating branch is highly susceptible when you have a hip dislocation. And this is the vessel which, when you make a neck cut, you normally protect by putting 
a talent or a blunt homan and uh, uh, you have to appreciate that this is foot is the most susceptible in injury in in terms of a hip dislocation now one has to always think about the sciatic nerve and the sciatic nerve so whenever i have a hip dislocation a primary or from a hip uh, replacement dislocation i always worry about the sciatic nerve and the sciatic nerve is the first thing which i would check whether it is um, affected or not affected because if the sciatic nerve is not affected you have time to work on if the sciatic nerve is affected okay you, do, you have very less time to work on and one has to always appreciate the cranial and the tibial component of the sciatic nerve okay because that comes slightly laterally compared to the other nerves the, the other the other uh, origin of it now the majority of the posterior dislocation of a virgin hip comes from a high energy trauma now in my practice about 20 to 30 percentage of the virgin hip dislocations comes from an elderly population and the elderly population doesn't have to be a high energy trauma it could be just from a uh, a fall from a standing height as a matter of fact the last five hip dislocations in a virgin hip i have seen are 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 not big trauma but fall from a height or fall from standing height in elderly population so one has to always appreciate that a hip dislocation um of a virgin hip is not mainly from a massive trauma but if you are looking at a young patient the hip dislocation is mainly coming from a high energy trauma now this is what one would see that is an axial load or when the uh, the load is applied of the fem of the femur when the hip is flexed and most commonly this occurs as an impact of the dashboard on the knee now types of posterior dislocation depends upon the direction of the applied force the position of the hip and the strength of the patient's bone and now i'm talking about a young patient this is quite irrelevant when you talk about elderly patient now and the effect of the dislocation on the femoral head circulation so this is the most important thing so what do we worry about when you have a posterior hip dislocation you are mostly worried about a vascular necrosis of the femoral head at the time of injury and also how does it progress with time this is what you will see when you see a patient in any or casualty that is most of them the, the, the time the leg is in forced abduction and external rotation of the hip the anterior capsule is torn or avulsed what are the effects of the femoral head dislocation on the femoral head so as i previously said injury the ascending cervical branch is associated with the damage to the capsule during dislocation and this also affects because the ligamentum teres is affected it also affects 
with the other probabilities that occurs with the hip dislocation. It's very important to early identify that and relocate the hip, improve the blood flow to the femoral head. And there are numerous studies to show what are the associated injuries that occurs as a result of hip dislocation. Now, you will see majority of young hip that dislocates. And I keep on saying young hip because in an, in an elderly population, the energy associated the hip dislocation is not massive, and this could occur secondary to a fall from a standing height as if the legs have split, like a split of the hip and cause a similar dislocation of the hip. And, I, and as a matter of fact, this is what the last one I saw a couple of weeks ago. And in a young hip, this is what you would see, a mechanism of a knee injury to a uh, for uh, to the dashboard, which causes a patella fracture, foot fracture, if the knee is extended. Now, associated knee injury occurs in 25% of patients with knee injury. It could be anything um, from knee injury, patella fracture, knee dislocation, and rupture. But the point here is that when you have a hip dislocation, you should do an ATLS uh, structured approach to the patient, do a primary survey, a secondary survey, and a tertiary survey. You might save the patient by reducing the hip, but if the patient has got a patella and an injury, which you have missed, probably will at the end. And I have had a few occasions where patients have come back and sued the trust or the hospital because we have missed something. It is vital that we do a secondary survey and a tertiary survey to find any other sort of injury. Now, associated injury, as I said to you before, the sciatic nerve is the most important thing to check from apart from the blood supply. And there's about 10 percentage chance that you can have a sciatic nerve injury associated with a hip dislocation. If you have a sciatic nerve injury, with the hip dislocation, the time is ticking. It is crucial to, to, to make necessary steps to decrease the neuropraxia. Majority of the time is neuropraxia of the sciatic nerve. And it's very important to work within the time limit to, uh, to decrease the pressure on the nerve as if you notice that there is neuropraxia. And from a documentation point of view, it is crucial that one always makes sure the sciatic nerve is, 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 is working. So the first thing, if somebody calls me from the middle of the night, my registrar calls me and said there is a, uh, there's a hip dislocation. Automatically in my brain, the first thing I ask is, is the sciatic nerve working? And all of you should have the same concept of asking society now working what is the secondary survey what is the tertiary survey so so, so um and the classification of the hip dislocations now this is uh, important to you know the thompson epstein classification one is type one is a pure dislocation with uh, with the, uh, a posterior uh, uh, wall fragment dislocation with a large posterior wall fragment it's a dislocation with a community posterior wall fragment, dislocation with an acetabular flow, 
and dislocation with the femoral head fracture. In my personal opinion, I always worry about the fourth and the fifth. In orthopedics, we are very fortunate to have four or five in every classification. If anybody asks you in the exam, uh, you describe to me the classification always in any classification say four or five you're lucky either four or five always works and the fourth and the fifth is always the worst one but in practicality i start really worrying when i reach uh, when when somebody says that there's an acetabular flow fracture or there is dislocation in the femoral head the similar is the Epstein classification of the anterior hip dislocation. Um, slightly different, but altogether it is pretty much the similar. Now, AO classification is um, anterior hip dislocation, posterior hip dislocation, or the obturator anterior inferior dislocation. Now, the most important thing is to evaluate the history and ascertain what are the other injuries associated associated with it, ex including the fact about whether the patient is alert and so on and so forth. Now, this is what you will classically find in a posterior hip dislocation, where the hip is flexed and internally rotated and adapted. Now, this is what you will see in an anterior hip dislocation, as I have previously suggested. Now, um, um, sometimes you could have a femoral head or a neck fracture or a shaft fracture. So it is quite important, as we previously suggested, to do a primary and a secondary survey to find out what are the other fractures associated with it. So you, it is very normal for us as orthopedic surgeons to go gun ho on the hip. The most important thing is make sure that we do a thorough primary survey. AVA takes the first course, yeah, A, B, C, D. And please intervene when you are asked to intervene and work as a team. The primary problem arises is that if we go with like a, you know, I have got a hip dislocation, that is what I am going to sort out the patient. The patient might have an associated chest infection, a pneumothorax, a tracheal shift, a head injury. And if we do not if we do not control that and go focus on the hip, okay, it might cause us problems. Always document what you have seen at the beginning. Now. As previous, uh, sorry, I keep on coming back to the ATLS. I'm an ATLS instructor and I'm quite passionate about um, um, uh, the, the fact that we should always tr treat patients as in totality and not just the femoral and just not the hip dislocation. Okay, and always provide enough information to proceed with a closed traction. Now, the first and foremost is to obtain an X ray. Okay, and in, in this DNA, majority of the times we will have a head, we will have a, um, uh, a neck, a, a chest, and a pelvic CT scan as a part of the trauma series. And hence, we would be able to find any associated injuries associated with it. Now, uh, we are sticking to the X-ray because it's easy to show the X-ray. The X-rays, uh, Judith's views of the pelvis um, is, is quite good. Um, uh, I do that often but at the, in, the, in the present day and age. Sometimes it's very difficult to do Judith's views and I normally, stuck, uh, normally stick to CT scan, um, uh, which is much more easier to do and 3D reconstructions. When you have a CT, you're primarily looking at what, obviously, the dislocation, whether there is a neck femur fracture, whether there is femoral head fracture, and size of the bony fragments is quite crucial. The MRI, where does the MRI comes into play? So I normally, as a routine practice, take an MRI of the femoral head after the hip 
is reduced. So this is I'm not uh, I'm not suggesting we do it before the hip is reduced. After the hip is reduced, document what is the end of the hip. And it's essential as time goes by. We document. so one of the most important worries once you have reduced the femoral head is vascular necrosis of the femoral head. And in my opinion, it is important that you have an MRI scan before and after, because when the patient comes back to my the clinic in six months time, six weeks, I normally take an MRI, look at the AVN, if this AVN. It is important for me to compare previous to the post, see how it goes. It is not essential to have an MRI scan, because this is when the patient has a virgin hip dislocation, you're primarily concerned about associated fractures and how to treat the patient. Uh, so uh, the most important thing is an X-ray, a primary survey, a secondary survey, and a CT scan. And the goal, as we suggested previously, is to reduce the hip prevent AVN. Now, um, the important thing here is to require proper anesthetic. So this is where ATLS comes into law. A hip joint is difficult to dislocate. So you would require adequate anesthetics plus a good muscle relaxant. To get muscle relaxant, the anesthetist has to be happy patient hasn't got a pneumothorax or any other causes like head injury where the, uh, the, um, the, sub, uh, the, the subdural pressures are, are affected when they anesthetize the patients. So um, there is some controversy in the literature um, in the appropriate time of reduction, but majority of the unit Universal agreement is earlier, sooner, the better. Now, aesthetics, as we suggested, we need to have a good muscle relaxant effect and general anesthetics. So uh, sometimes I have done this in accident and emergency. Sometimes I have done this in, a, in theater. Always theater is better because the patient is better anesthetized. You have intraoperative x-rays, look at it. And second, the most important thing is once you have reduced the hip, you know that how stable the hip is to see whether you need to, to intervene or not. But sometimes in my practice, if the theaters are working. So in the UK, that in, a, in a district general hospital or a, or a secondary care center. So whether it's a secondary care or a tertiary care in UK, so I work in between secondary and tertiary care, you only have one theater working 24 seven. So if you have, uh, for example, an abdominal aortic aneurysm or a laparotomy going in theater, which has just started you might not have the time to wait for two or three hours in, uh, for reducing hip dislocation. In that particular event, I have advised my registrars or I have gone to AME to reduce the hip to save time. The problem in that process is that you would not be in, in UK practice, it is unable, we are unable, we, we don't have live stream x-ray, so you have to take the patient back to the x a &E, sorry, the, to the radiology department to have an x-ray, and it's difficult to check how stable the hip is. In an ideal scenario, it is better if we have it done in a, in a, in a proper theater, but having said that, the sooner you reduce, the better it is.
production manure, normally it requires two people. Uh, there, um, there are two techniques, supine and prone. I'm not going to go more on that. I've always done the supine manure, but uh, uh, there is a prone manure also, the prone manure. Um, I don't think it is the greatest manure because you have to appreciate this patients have got other injuries. The anesthetist will start getting nervous if you have to put the patient prone and so on and so forth. Okay, The advantage of, of prone position is it's a one person technique and important and, and it is a bit impractical in trauma patients. Okay, and um, uh, the normal philosophy in the supine position is to flex the hip to 90 degrees as we assuming majority of them are posterior dislocation and give uh, traction and the hip will come back to position. Uh, now, if you look at it, uh, you, can, uh, you can imagine there are various forms of pushing the hip with one person stabilizing the anterior superior spine uh, iliac spine or the pelvis and the other person pulling it. You can also do traction if you want to. Um, majority of the times it will come by manual traction, uh, but you certainly can do a, uh, a traction um, uh, or you can put a Steinman pin into the hip joint. Uh, I've rarely done that, but it's, it's possible you can do that too. So, uh, uh, the most important thing is after you have reduced the hip, you have to test for the stability of the hip, see how unstable the hip is. Sometimes if the hip is unstable, you have to make sure that temporarily the hip remains in. So whenever you have a hip dislocation, you have to think in a, in a very systematic manner systematic manner, sorry for being a broken record, the most important thing is to reduce the hip. Uh, most important thing is to reduce the hip, but the most important thing from before that is to make sure there are no associated other injuries. Okay? And once you have reduced the hip, you have to check for the stability of the hip, to see whether the hip is inside or whether the hip comes out. The easy the easiest thing to keep the hip reduced is to make sure the hip the knee is extended by putting a cricket splint or by putting a traction. Now, the stability of the hip can be checked in various factors. Now, one has to always appreciate the fact that posterior wall fractures is one thing which can cause problems. The definition a virgin hip will always, or majority of the time, have a posterior wall dislocation. And hence, the hip is not as stable as what one would want to. Now, this is important. <laughs> what do you, what, how do you manage when the hip is an irreducible hip? And whenever, as a registrar, you have this in any, you have to always think about, it is not just pulling the hip. The, the hip might come back, the hip doesn't come back. What are What is your management protocol? And hence, a pre-op CT is very important to determine how the posterior wall is doing, how many fragments they are, and what are the associated injuries related to that. So I always ask my registrars or the front um, or um, uh, um, see if all the a &E staff see if it could be reduced once. Repeated effects of the same thing is not going to be successful, nor is it going to be helpful to the neurovascular structures or the articular cartilage. So what you have to think in terms of a hip dislocation, once it has happened, a virgin hip, what are the secondary procedures? So if the hip is stable, 
of the production and the hip is congruent, you can wait and watch my practice. The majority of the time is once the hip is reduced, I would watch the patient like a hawk and review the patient regularly, limit the flexion of the hip about 60 degrees. I would early mobilize the patient. Weight bearing, if it's an elderly patient, it is difficult to touch weight bear them. I would normally weight bear, weight bear, weight bear them as pain allows. Because you can tell the elderly patient to touch weight by them. Normally, it never goes. The patient is bedridden. After that, gets deep pain thrombosis, gets a pulmonary embolism, and the conversation goes from there. But in a young patient, if possible, you should touch weight by them for four to six weeks. Now, <clears throat> what are the indications for operating? Treatment. So, indication for operative treatment is an irreducible hip dislocation, hip dislocation with a femoral neck fracture, incarceration of fragments or fragments are present inside the joint, or if it's incongruent, or an unstable hip after reduction. Now, um, uh, number one, Number two and number three are quite obvious. You got um, uh, do a pretty treatment. Hence, coming back to my statement, when you have a hip dislocation, if you are in a, in a secondary setting, so in UK, the secondary setting or a, a primary setting is a general practice setting. A secondary setting is a district general hospital, which has got all the facilities, except having a pelvic surgeon. Uh, you may or may not have, for example, I, I, do, uh, I do everything in hips. I do pelvis also, uh, uh, but I, I work in, as I said previously, I work in between primary and a secondary, uh, sorry, in between a secondary and a tertiary setting. And a tertiary setting is when you have an acetabula and a pelvic surgeon uh, who is trained um, and has got their own role uh, uh, on call road working. So if you are seeing majority of us are working um, uh, in, uh, in a secondary setting, um, I'm fortunate enough to work in a secondary setting with more input on it. But when you're working in a such a setting, it is important to understand for example, um, you know, you you might not have a pelvic surgeon with you in your rota. It is quite crucial not to attempt to start uh, operating on a patient if you are doing less than ten operations a year in the acetabulum, and try to work around it. So, any acetabular fractures associated with this. I would refer this to a tertiary referral center because you know it is just a number game. Um, uh, most of us can get into a hip joint, but reducing the posterior wall, fixing the posterior wall, if you don't do it on a regular basis, please don't do it. Please, please, please refer it to a tertiary referral center, provided the neurovascular structures are intact or you have done the uh, the, 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 the primary care to the patient that is by reducing the hip and, and decreasing the pressure on the sciatic nerve. Because it is quite important to plan for this patient. What are the effects? Majority of, so I, majority of them will come back in 10, 20 years time with an arthritic hip. You really need to understand how do we plan the, 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 the process of this patient or the life expect or, or what is the life expectancy of the femoral head in this patient and, and how do we plan the surgery. So, so if you have an irreducible hip, 
So what are the approaches available? That is a Smith Peterson's approach or a Watson Jones approach, similar approach. Um, uh, um, and how do you play the uh, place, placement of a uh, stain Steinman team at the intercrocantric inter region, manipulate the femoral head, repair the capsule um, uh, if it's accomplished with further dissection. Um, you have the Langham bag approach for the posterior. So it, it is the um, it, the first one I said was for anterior pro anterior dislocation. Second one was for the posterior dislocation. The Cochrane Langham bag approach is a fantastic approach. You know, it lays open everything. You can repair pretty much everything you want, you want to by that approach. I um, I, I do about give or take about 900 to 1,000 operations a year. Um, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I, I, my um, elective practices is complex uh, hip replacements and revision surgery. So I'm very comfortable doing posterior approaches. So unlike my approach is not something which I would worry about, but um, um, and the, the anterior approach uh, is not something which I, offer, I use often enough. Uh, I use often to be comfortable with, but um, one has to always delineate, delineate which way one is going uh, from an anatomy point of view, because it's quite crucial. When you have a patient with a multiple trauma injury, what you want is a slick operation, reduce the hip and be comfortable about the anatomy when you're going in. So when you have posterior dislocation with a large femoral head fracture. Now this is when it, it, it gets into what I would say tiger territory or when you have to be very crucial from the, from the time point of view, the team around you and how to do this. These are rare factors and I normally uh, probably would not see more than one or two a year. So you have to be bang, 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 you need the right team, the right anesthetist and to get on with it. So you have got three options. Is the easiest option I would start with is the GANS, tantric flip osteotomy, which makes it much more easier to associate, to reduce the fracture, to put it back in and stabilize the fracture, so on and so forth. The other fractures are detached, the femoral head ligament, reduce the hip through a posterior incision, second option. The best option, is, but whatever you do, it is quite important to appreciate that how do you preserve the blood supply, the femoral head, or decrease the amount of damage that can happen to the blood supply. Now, hip dislocation with a femoral neck fracture, one is always concerned about ADN and um, uh, you have to appreciate the fracture. The, the, the point that close reduction is not something which I would advise when you have femoral neck fracture. And you have to appreciate the point that if you have a femoral neck fracture with hip dislocation, it's usually posterior dislocation. The posterior approach is much more easier to sort it out, to look at the bigger picture and sort it out with the hip dislocation, stabilize the neck of femur fracture. Now, incarcerated fragments, as I previously said, is much better if you have a CT, appreciate if you have very small fragments, surgical removal is necessary, prevent the abrasive wear of the cartilage because what you don't want is small fragments or loose bodies around there, which causes further arthritis of, um, of the hip, okay? It's very hard to know how much to remove, but you want to make sure that you have got a congruent hip at the end. Now, if you have femoral 
head fracture, or that is if you have an incongruent reduction, that is either there's an acetabular fracture at weight bearing portion, or you have a femoral head fracture. The goal here is to achieve congruency. That is the most important thing you have to think about when you have an incongruent reduction. An incongruent reduction can cause problems and in mostly in adults, uh, you can have the loose bodies removed arthroscopically. The benefit of arthroscopic reduction is a bit debatable. Um, I, uh, in my opinion, um, I would, uh, jury is still out or not sure what is the right pattern of treatment. Now, this is one which you always have to worry about. Once you have reduced the hip, hip is unstable, what do you do? Either it is due to a posterior wall problem or if there is a labral detachment or a stay or a tear. The labral detachment is slightly uncommon. It is mostly because of a posterior wall or a femoral head fracture that uh, it is unstable. Now, the results of treatment, large range, uh, you have to appreciate the point that irreducible hip dislocations are strongly associated with poor results. That is fundamentally what you need to let the patient and the family know about. Now, what are the complications of the hip dislocation? As we have suggested, the most important complication one has to worry is about a vascular necrosis of the femoral head and a vascular necrosis of the femoral head is implied in majority of the research that is available that, uh, that your risk of AVN increases um, as your surgical time delays. And hence, I have previously suggested that it should be reduced as soon as possible. Some of the numbers that have relate is within six hours. We uh, there's a higher chance, a 20 times higher chance if the hip is not reduced. And the research has come down a little bit on the numbers, but the most important point is to reduce the hip. But you have to appreciate the fact, not to jump into treatment without knowing what is the, what are you going to do? It's always safe see if you can closely reduce the hip. But if you are going to open the hip up, you, you should know what you are going to do if the hip is unstable. Post-traumatic osteoarthritis, I get a lot of this. this is, as a matter of fact, majority of my work is associated around post-traumatic osteoarthritis. It can occur because of ABN. It can occur because of several cartilaginous injury. It can occur because of a femoral head or acetabular fractures. Now, a recurrent dislocation, this is rare. I personally don't have a lot of experience on that. As a matter of fact, I might have seen one or two um, um, in earlier Danlos syndrome, um, uh, not a lot. I, 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 I can't say a lot about this because I have not seen this on a regular basis. You know, in earlier Danlos syndrome, I have, have had patients who say that, oh, the hip comes out and comes in. Uh, I'm not entirely sure um, that I have got any visualization or X-rays or MRI scans through so. Now, recurrent dislocations can occur because of the post, because of defect in the, in the in the femoral head or the posterior wall. Now, delayed diagnosis. Uh, uh, I have probably in my twenty years experience uh, maybe had one or two, um, and that too uh, about 
not delayed, delayed maybe uh, three or uh, two to three weeks because they were ITU admissions. They were uh, intubated when they came out of intubation. They had a, a missed hip dislocations. Um, um, uh, uh, the bottom line is that even if you see a delayed dislocation, you still need to reduce the hip. Think, imagine as if you are doing a, a shoulder dislocation, but shoulder dislocation and neglect shoulder dislocation can work, but a hip dislocation, hip is a weight-bearing joint and you can't do that. Sciatic nerve injury occurs in 20% of adults, 5% of pediatric patients with a hip dislocation, and perineal, perineal nerve is affected more common than tibial nerve because as we previously said from the anatomy of the sciatic nerve, that is how this is affected. Nerve is stretched, compressed, or transected. Majority of the time, it is neurotaxia. And about 40% of the time, it's complete resolution if you have um, uh, a, um, a nerve that has got neuropraxia on it. Now, if sciatic nerve does not improve within three to four weeks' time, what are the options available? You do an EMG study to see what kind of uh, nerve damage is there. And from there, you can take on the process. So it is important, as I previously suggested, that clear documentation of the neurovascular arrangement in terms of sensory and motor function of sciatic nerve is, is important pre and post reduction appreciate um, uh, um, uh, uh, what are the intervention that is required. Now, foot drop, if you have a foot drop after the, after uh, which you have seen before, once it is reduced, you can, uh, you know, you can splint it and improve the gait and uh, which, will improve, which will prevent the contractures. Infections, if you have, if you have opened it up, is about one to five percent. Antibiotics is required. Um, uh, and uh, the most important thing is to make sure that you have uh, you have got joint stability. And iatrogenic sciatic nerve is most common. The posterior approach to the hip, um, uh, um, um, uh, and it might be because of prolonged uh, uh, retraction of the nerve. Iatrogenic sciatic nerve could be prevent prevention is by preventing hip in full extension or maintaining knee inflection and avoid retraction in lesser sciatic nerve injuries. Now, it's very important to remember that majority of these patients will have multiple trauma injury. And when you have a multiple trauma injury, you have to think of embolism and DVT. So this is where you will have to think whether the patient needs a, a warfarin, low molecular weight heparin, whether the patient needs an uh, uh, IVC in um, uh, inferior vena cover uh, filter on, and what kind of um, uh, prevention the patient needs for six months to make sure the patient does not die of a DVT. Now, this is primarily to do with uh, virgin hips. Now, as far as um, when you have a um, a, a, a hip which has got a hip replacement, which has dislocated. I'm just going to say one sentence, apologies for using more of my time, is that always think about patient factors, instrumentation factors, and surgeon factors. And from there, you have to decide which way you have to intervene when you have a hip replacement. Thank you very much, and apo sincere apologies if I have run out of time. Thank you so much, Mr. Yonathan, for this very comprehensive presentation. Thank you, sir. Any questions? How does it work normally? Yeah, it's, it's an excellent presentation, sir. Uh, Mr. Ahmed Sheikh from uh, UK will be uh, the moderator with you, sir, uh, waiting for any questions. Dr. Ahmed? Can I have yeah. a question? Thank Professor uh, Bahad, yes, please go on. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for your uh, nice presentation. Just uh, I wanted to concern, if you have a reducible hip, it is better to uh, do a CT or MRI because uh, you mentioned that you are going to, see, to do CT. 
but uh, sometimes uh, reducible behavior can be due to soft tissues like bioforms, like uh, muscles or capsular uh, herniations, something like that. So uh, which one modalities you prefer to do it? So, so I, uh, thank you. So thank you for the question. So I normally prefer CT and the simple reason is in my hospital CT is faster to obtain. Um, um, uh, uh, but given an opportunity, I will have CT and MRI scan. I see. Um, uh, following that question, um, regarding the MRI, because you mentioned that the, the main uh, concern about MRI is to have a bottom line MRI to be compared with any future MRI. So uh, apart from the emergent situation when the hip is dislocated of the dislocation, would you still request MRI on uh, maybe after a week or two to have this bottom line MRI for, for further follow up after six months or 12 months or so? Uh, very good question. Yes, always by definition, I will have an MRI um, after the hip is reduced um, um, and, uh, as a baseline investigation. It is not necessary. Literature is not clear on that. Uh, but in my, this is my personal practice. In my personal practice, I'll always have an MRI before and after. Simply, simple reason is that if the patient comes back at three months or or or, or six weeks, there's a possibility there on the stir sequence. There's a lot of inflammation. There's a lot of edema in the bone. So one does not know what is new, what is old, and that for simply for that reason, I would request an MRI scan. Yeah. Um, regarding the same point, uh, the CT, uh, just one of our colleagues asking, before the reduction of the dislocation or after the reduction? So you request two CTs or just one after the reduction? Um, no. So I will always have a CT before the reduction. Now, based on the fact if there is a, a posterior wall fracture, which has got several fragments, I will always have a CT afterwards to make yeah. sure that the hip is congruent. Um, if um, so, in my, uh, for, 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 uh, for thoroughness of the practice, I will always have a pre and a post CT. Perfect, perfect. And after the reduction, uh, regarding the traction, a uh, question about skin or skeletal uh, traction. So, so in my practice, majority of the times I can get away by by doing a skin traction or by putting a cricket bat splint that is to make sure the hip the knee is not flexed i rarely put uh, um, um, a bony traction for a hip um, uh, uh, after the hip is reduced because if you have to put a bony traction that simply means that you have to the hip is too unstable and you need to go primarily in and to fix it back Okay, um, one, a, a complex situation, when you have a pelvic ring fracture with a dislocation, uh, how would you address the pelvic ring first or the dislocation first? Um, um, so um, if you, I will always reduce the fracture first and, and, and to decrease the pressure on the sciatic nerve and then address the pelvic ring. So as I said to you, I am a primarily not a pelvic surgeon and majority of us are not pelvic surgeons. So um, um, I would reduce the hip, uh, make sure the neuropraxia or the sciatic nerve pressure is decreased. And then if the, if the, if, uh, and then refer appropriately if the pelvic, uh, pelvic ring has to be addressed. Okay. Uh, one of our colleagues from Iraq asked about, did the classification mention describe floating hip in associated pelvic and femoral fractures? Uh, no, I, it, I have not mentioned that uh, aspect of it. A floating hip, um, to be honest with you, uh, it's very rare and, um, and probably the panel will have more experience than me. I really do not have an experience of a floating hip, so that's why I didn't mention that. No, that's fine. Uh, regarding sciatic nerve palsy, I, I have a question myself. Uh, regarding the bottom line investigation, would you uh, go for EMG nerve conduction velocity after the patient stabilized, maybe after a week or so, just to calculate the bottom line uh, sciatic nerve also for further uh, 
So th that is a th that is a very good question. The problem uh, I have. So in my opinion, the MRI with, with, an, with a very good radiologist will give you a very good idea of the sciatic nerve problem from um, uh, initially. The EMG study done initially is really, you can, you certainly can do an EMG study initially, but in my opinion, I have not got a lot of information from an, from a, from an, from an EMG study done in immediately after the hip has been reduced. And uh, I think the, the results are quite checkered on that. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Yanithan, for uh, this uh, very uh, uh, fruitful and interesting presentation. Uh, hoping to see you again and again with us in uh, the course, sir. Thank you so much and Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for having me here. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thank you, thank you so, so much, much, sir.